21st century brought a digital media revolution that promised more information at our fingertips than ever before. It was supposed to make life easier, bringing convenience and accessibility. Yet it simultaneously brought new dangers to consumers, like the ubiquitous consumption of fake news, like this. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons, um, and they are beautiful pictures of, uh, of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight over this airfield. Democracies depend on the access of legitimate information. When accurate news is obfuscated or eliminated, the electorate is susceptible to the persuasion of fake news producers. Whereas figures like Adolf Hitler, Donald Trump, and the Philippines' Rodrigo Duterte have used the concept to fabricate a threat to democracy, actual fake news poses a real threat to democracy. Today's media landscape offers an abundance of spectacle, infotainment, and celebrity fetishism, beamed into our TVs and smartphones 24 hours a day for the purpose of directing consumers' attention to advertisements. This seemingly endless stream of market-driven content leaves people with almost no usable evidence to decipher fact from fiction and journalism from fake news. I would say that most of my media consumption revolves around social media at this point. I consume a lot of different types of media whether that's film, television, news, um, social media. I read a lot of news, which is good, but then I also watch a lot of TV. Most of it is a form of social media. Just browsing Reddit, and um, I guess through that I have multiple different sources. Before people were like, reading the whole paper, now we're on Facebook, we just read the title of the article usually. A lot of my consumption habits is coming from TV, clickbait news stories, usually about entertainment. Um, every now and again, I go on Yahoo, but I tend to stay away from it if I'm trying to have a good day. Some people will just start clicking on websites and links and not really think about where they're going, and then they'll end up somewhere they shouldn't be. And then a lot of people can sort of become radicalized by some of that stuff. It's it's really easy to get lost. Um, you, you start going down a rabbit hole and all of a sudden you think, what, what did I do with my day? We're so consumed with media, so consumed with our phones that it's like we hardly ever take the time to really look at what's going on outside. You know, it's called social media, uh, but it's not, you know, the most social thing because everyone's screen, you know, is like an individual screen. Just the narratives and just kind of how um, those cater each specifically to that person. Even though I get to choose what I'm looking for, there's a lot of algorithms and a lot of technology way above my pay grade to know that really is also honing on all specific things and making it harder to really diversify what I'm, what I'm seeing. While it can uh, present good ideas, it can also promote toxicity and create this sort of bubbles of um, echo chambers where there's uh, one political idea and there isn't as much room for nuance. If, for example, you're liberal, you will just listen to this liberal media that will just like be critical of the other Republican media without stating facts. Most of the time it will just be like a, a shouting game. And depending on what, you, what you're watching or what, what it is that you're doing, you will notice that you're always being constantly like distracted, watched, um, and advertised too. People my age are using social media as their primary outlet for news consumption, which can be dangerous, of course, because they're not verified sources largely. Being used to this social media age where we want the instant gratification of likes and shares and everything like that, it makes it hard to be critical of that and think critically about what we're absorbing and um, choose how we want to be affected by the media that we consume. Because at this stage, I feel that a lot of people are affected and have an emotional response to news and whatever media they're consuming. They look at likes, it's like an addiction. You know, it's the next thing, it's like gives them that, that high that, they, that they're looking for. It may not be from like alcohol or, you know, any type of drug, but um, it still releases a 
some sense endorphins in your mind to kind of just stimulate you and just make you feel good about yourself. I suffer from that myself, full irony, right? I'm a media educator and yet there I am on Facebook way too many hours of the day. Um, Twitter is a bit more focused tool for me, but Facebook is a time sink. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of Americans, well, a lot of people around the world, really. And unfortunately, there are lots of dangers attached to that because you know, I grew up at a time when we had three channels. Well, four if you counted PBS. Um, so you, you couldn't really watch TV all day long. You couldn't consume this kind of media all the time. There's this other habit of ours feeling that if we're not in the know constantly, we're, we're left behind. And I think that also feeds this really bad habit that we've come to experience. Um, along with our phones. Um, it's constant. The messaging is constant, yet the messaging, along with the programming, is so horrific that it's not allowing ourselves to stop and really ask the big, bigger questions in life. I think when it feels like we're paying attention to everything, a negative consequence of that could be that we are qualitatively paying attention to nothing. We think we're good at that, but in fact, our brains don't multitask. They monotask. They just, our brains are really generous and try and monotask as quickly as possible. But I think we're also hurting our brains a little bit with all this multitasking. Uh, the average person spends somewhere between 11 and 16 hours a day consuming media, which is quite amazing considering the fact the average person sleeps eight hours a day. So most of the time people are awake, they're consuming media. And so as a result, it influences people's perspectives of the world, it informs people, and, and media has a place in humans' lives unmatched by anything else. It's a really big influence in who we are. We are rewarded the more time we spend with media. We are rewarded the more distracted we are by media. All of our media choices can fit in our pocket if we have a smartphone, which means we can be checking email, checking text messages on all of our social media platforms, watching TV, watching movies, listening to music, catching up on the news, in a teeny tiny little device. We never have to turn our media off. Right? I mean, the internet is, if it is available, it is always available. So we never, we never need to turn our media off. We are drowning in information and we don't know how to sort it. And having more of it isn't really necessarily helping us. Uh, greater access is interesting. But if you just accept everything and filter nothing, what is that doing to, to our thinking and our interaction with other humans when it comes to human interaction? We're not allowing ourselves to think. We're using the, the ideals, the messaging of others to really navigate our own lives. Um, and with that, we don't have that, just that quiet time to really to ask harder questions. Um, I think that is also taking us and taking many, especially our more vulnerable people, um, and I'm calling out the teens, to a much more depressive state. Because although on the surface level, it looks like you're connected, to what's going on, the, the emptiness that you're experiencing in your own life is, is tremendous. And I think there are so many kids who are experiencing that, adults as well. It's, it's a really anti-social uh, uh, set of images that we're receiving. And it's, it, it makes us miserably unhappy, you know. It, 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 it is not conducive to happiness because at the risk of sounding banal, say that happiness comes from within, it comes from a certain sense of uh, adjustment to one's surroundings and an ability to forge meaningful relationships with other people. It's based on an ability to care about other people, to do things for others, right? Whereas the messages that we absorb, whether they're advertising messages or often entertainments, heroic entertainments on TV or on the big screen, uh, it's all about you. Media. In, in this country has come to dominate literally cognitive thought in a vast majority of, of Americans. And it's pretty deliberate. It's uh, top-down controlled corporate media, a uh, very small number of companies owned by giant uh, investment companies uh, worldwide, and they are in the process, continued process of propagandizing us um, in terms of uh, protecting capitalism and uh, keeping us uh, entertained and, um, and buying things. Much of what we get is really just commercial advertising in disguise or half disguised, right? So it's meant to sell us not only on particular products that we don't really need and don't benefit from, 
but also on consumption as a way of life. We're being manipulated to um, want to acquire things that we don't need, to um, kind of misinform us about some of the contradictions in, in global society and capitalism and gross inequalities, and uh, better, better, literally, using Neil Postman's uh, term, entertaining us to death. News reflects their interests. They tell us what is important. So it's important what celebrities are doing. It's not so important what your military is doing overseas. These are the good guys in these country. These are the bad guys in that country. Um, our country's purpose is to make money. Education's purpose is to make money. All other things are socialist, communist, or other negative terms. And the corporate media that BOF works in concert with, um, you know, with the two major corporate parties, uh, they're largely selling the same agendas. And we don't really get a lot of bottom-up uh, diverse viewpoints uh, expressed in our media. We get more of a managed top-down news propaganda that's more manufacturing consent among the public. So unfortunately in the 21st century we have quite the conundrum because we simultaneously have uh, more information at our fingertips than we've ever had before, but we also have a paucity of understanding connected to the fact that we don't really develop critical thinking skills and we don't teach many critical thinking skills in our K-12 curriculum. It's incumbent upon the consumer to go find out what this source is, where it comes from, who generates it, and the purpose of its generation. So, and I think that we don't have a tolerance for that kind of work on our part. We just, we're blind consumer. We just kind of, it's like eating junk food. We don't even think about it. I guess you should first take note of the fact that we use that verb consume, right? Um, as if media were something that we're feeding on, that we're swallowing, digesting, right? Um, I think there's a difference between consuming media and um, uh, using it uh, to inform ourselves, to educate ourselves. Um, but if we're consuming it, we're taking it in without giving it a whole lot of thought. There's a real psychic problem and an emotional problem and a political problem. It's tiring because it's so sensational and your whole body and emotions get... get um, get tired and exhausted. It's not providing the kinds of local and national and inter-news that we need. So it's actually a big time waster. And as we know, there's now a whole dimension of fake commercial news and fake political news. We see a weird confluence of events happening in the 21st century. So fake news is also exploding in, in the social media realm. Uh, because an individual can take one item and share it, and it can be spread everywhere. And even though it's fake, you can get a majority of the population to believe it. So we've put this, this already really powerful tool, which is news media, in everybody's hand. Everybody can make news, everybody can consume news. But what's missing from new media compared to old media, we used to have gatekeepers. And these gatekeepers theoretically had codes of ethics, and they were held up to standards by their colleagues. Now in the social media realm, people are only held up to their own morals and ethics, and we're finding a lot of people don't have morals and ethics. Since the tumultuous events of the 1970s, with the confusion and lies surrounding the Vietnam War, Watergate, and the Church Committee hearings, which exposed connections between the CIA and the media, the American public has lost faith in its public institutions, including the so-called free press. At the same time, right-wing politicians and commentators injected American discourse with the hasty generalization that the news media had a liberal bias. The phrase's usage insinuated that the press was more focused on some liberal agenda than serving the public interest. It was an effective weapon to discredit any news reporting that challenged their worldview, a talking point that is permeated throughout American society to this day. Although there is nothing liberal about six corporations controlling 90% of the news media, conservatives continue to erroneously assert that it is fake news, not empirical data, that undermines their political, social, and economic policies. The ease with which it came to dominate American thinking was a harbinger of the fake news epithet that President Donald Trump exploited to discredit the press that he described as the enemy of the American people. A few days ago, I called the fake news the enemy of the people, and they are. They are the enemy of the people. Don't we love that term, fake? What we've learned about fake over the last little while, fake news. 
I'm you, not going to give you can a you question. Can you stay categorical? You are fake me? news. But you don't give straight news. You give fake news. No, not you. Not you. That was just fake news by NBC, uh, which gives a lot of fake news. Your organization's terrible. Because they have no sources. They just make them up. Whoops, the camera just went off. <laughs> okay, you can come back. I won't say. Quiet. Quiet. And I want you all to know that we are fighting the fake news. It's fake. Phony. Fake. Fake news is an actual problem, but not in the way that Trump uses the phrase to denounce journalists. I would define fake news as anything that is not factual or accurately reported. News that doesn't have any facts to support its arguments. Uh, it's targeted false information. Uh, just misinformation that was put out and claimed real. Fake facts, opinions, without any credible um, evidence. Taking the fact of the story but completely transform them. The first person that comes to my mind is somebody like Alex Jones. Some of his stories are from InfoWars. And some of his stories are true and have been fact-checked, yet he is um, taking the time to sensationalize them and twist them and tweak them in certain ways to get people to react in certain ways. Facebook is a really big place for what you could call fake news because people just put their ideas out there and then it's passed off as truth. But when in reality, it's their truth and not an actual universal truth. And it's the, it's the ruling elite that really serve to benefit from all of the propaganda. And so it's really easy and clickbaity with social media and hashtags and, you know, uh, a good PR team. It is an uphill battle dealing with uh, media outlets, media companies, media conglomerates, um, that there is a goal of hegemony. Whoever is in control of the money is in control of the minds of the public, for sure. There's always been fake news. There's always been rumors. There's always been news that's been dominated by the elite. And there's always been news that's all about junk as opposed to what people really need. Uh, the problem at, in the, the current era is that the scope and scale has just increased dramatically. So fake news at the moment is driven by machines, driven by algorithms, and uh, driven by the profit motive. Everything's about hits and likes and they'll do pretty much anything in this bread and circuses mode to generate those likes or hits taking people away from the things that really matter in favor of stories that simply don't matter at all don't push the needle don't have anything relevant to say about our daily lives or our politics you can find fake news kind of across the political spectrum in the united states these days um, it's often generated by powerful state or corporate actors um, within kind of the corporate commercial for-profit model uh, of news. And news in the United States is an industry. It is a manufactured phenomenon. Well, fake news has become kind of a buzzword uh, that uh, was first used to uh, um, further demonize Donald Trump and then was used by Donald Trump to demonize those who were demonizing him. So the phrase fake news is used by both sides, uh, I think used by both sides with equal dishonesty. But the Democrats originally started saying that part of the reason that Trump was electored in by the Electoral College and became president was because people didn't come out and vote enough and they were fooled by fake news. Well, there's no real metric evidence that that actually happened and caused the election to go one way or the other. Then, of course, the Trump campaign and administration picked up on that fake news talk. So they basically, Trump, Trump turned around and said, well, anybody that's criticizing me or saying anything that I disagree with is fake news, right? And he started doing that with CNN and Jim Acosta uh, and just saying like, well, you're fake news. CNN, fake. <laughs> uh, we're to do a Google search or even a search in academia maybe about 10 years ago. Everything that's labeled as fake news would be shows like The Daily Show and The Colbert Report and SNL. That was fake news. And it meant that there's these news outlets that are doing satire. So they appear to be news, but they're actually mocking mainstream culture. There's a lot of attempts at cultural jamming and things like that. Um, the word's been co-opted now by, by Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump has used fake news to uh, be anything that he disagrees with. Anything that challenges him he doesn't like, that is fake news. Thanks to uh, a president who tells us consistently that the press are the enemy of the people, 
a lot of our focus now would be on what I would tend to think of as fake news originating the way it, the term is used by Trump as a weaponized term is focused on what we would think of as the corporate news media, right? Um, and I, you know, there's a weird way in which that critique has some veracity, has some reality to it, right? That uh, for a long time, Project Censored has been making the argument that we should be wary of the corporate news media, that what they're providing us may not be literally fake news in the sense that that term is used now, but it certainly fits broad definitions of what propaganda is. Fake news is propaganda, and it's generated by big public relation firms. The three largest are Omnicom, WPP, and Interpublic Group, and they in turn have hundreds of, of small public relations propaganda firms all over the world that work, for, work with them. And they represent uh, products, they represent corporations, they represent governments, uh, they represent the Pentagon, and uh, they are producing news stories and, and public relations pieces that corporate media were, literally runs as if they were, were news. So some 80% of corporate media today, the news there, um, is prepackaged by a public relations propaganda firm that has an agenda. And that agenda is to essentially entertain us, uh, keep us afraid of things that, uh, you know, of terrorists, and to make us uh, support the state and support uh, capitalism. News, by and large, is news by and about elites. And especially, there's a huge body of literature in the sociology of news construction about how corporate news depends on um, official bureaucratic sources as the, new, the newsworthy uh, perspectives and the newsworthy actors. And that's really different when you start looking at independent media Independent media and independent journalists are still dependent on sources, but the difference is the, the diversity of, of people who are treated as being newsworthy is so much more broad when we look at independent news media in comparison to the corporate news media. Only certain people's stories are told, only certain pe stories about the world um, are acceptable, and there's a wide variety, a massive vision um, of actions and a whole globe of communities out there work, working toward everything from a better life to ending the war to um, saving the environment that we just don't hear about. The fluff, the infotainment that's peddled by corporate outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, Washington Post, New York Times, that is fake news. What they want you to believe that's fake news is of course the exact opposite. The alternative media outlets that go to the front lines of domestic and foreign uh, fights, whether that be environmental fights, uh, racial justice fights. They want to brand that fake news because, of course, when you go to the front lines of these conflicts, you will see the reality of the empire laid bare. Fake news is, is meant to tag certain kinds of uh, stories or opinions as um, dangerously false, uh, toxic, and increasingly linked to Russia, okay, uh, so that, you know, we're actually living through a moment that's a kind of throwback to the 60s when J. Edgar Hoover and Richard Nixon and others, uh, the CIA, were all convinced that the, the, the tumult of that decade, you know, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, uh, the feminist movement, and so on, the assumption was well, all this stuff is obviously being fed by the communists, you know, it's coming from the Kremlin. Only now it's the, uh, you know, liberals and many progressives who are assuming that the prevalence of these divisive uh, narratives uh, or concerns is due to some kind of Russian connection, you know, as if there's not enough wrong with the system we're living in, and as if people are not smart enough to see many of the things that are wrong, on their own, without the help of Putin's minions, right? You know, again, we had we have so much information, people are saying, look, this is coming from Russia, and Russia took out fake ads on Facebook, and some Macedonian teenager was getting paid to pump out false stories about the Pope, and Trump, and Hillary, and these kind of things. Well, yeah, that that is fake news. Is this done to, for ill effect? Well, arguably it could be. 
right? It certainly could be used to deceive the public, and yeah, that would be fake news. But I think the far more insidious kind of fake news is actually corporate and deep state propaganda. Uh, because that is done with the intent to deceive, uh, but it also has the trappings of an official narrative supporting a status quo. Most dangerous untruths pumped out today don't come from Donald Trump, whose lies are mostly idiotic and trivial and really, really obvious, okay? I mean, he'll lie about the size of his inaugural crowd, stuff like that, right? The New York Times and the Post and you know, NPR and Rachel Maddow and all the rest of them, they make stuff up about Russia's interference with the election. It's based on no evidence at all. All right, Rachel Maddow. Um, I feel like we have spent the last two years doing one story, right? Um, one, doing a lot of one story. Right? Yeah. Is our president subordinate to a foreign power? And again, I have to stress that we need to describe this dossier as an unverified dossier of Russian allegations against Donald Trump. That Bernie Sanders lovers page run out of Albania, it's still there. Every day I leave my show and I think I'm gonna be talking about something else. But every day over the course of the news cycle, a new piece of it falls in place. Russian backed un online trolls flooded social media to try to block Mitt Romney from getting the Secretary of State job. This is like 9-11. This is the red warning lights blinking. This is, we, we need to be as, we need to be aware that the risk to the country right now is as strong as the risk was before 9-11. Liberal media consistently pumps out this kind of fake news, I think which is mostly hatched by uh, the CIA and other government agencies. And this stuff is war propaganda, you know, this stuff is really deeply dangerous. You know, fake news is an enormous problem, but part of the problem of fake news is the very misuse of that phrase by its most adroit practitioners. We've been in the business, we like the United States, of creating fake news sort of on purpose for decades. We have the creation of the CIA after World War II and they carry out covert operations and those covert operations are carried out with plausible deniability, meaning that they can make things happen of great political importance in countries around the world and then be able to lie about it later. And the media will write stories about it as though the lie that was put out, the cover stories, were true. So I always want to think about all this stuff from my vantage position as a transnational uh, uh, scholar and think about the historical context in which uh, media has always been used to disadvantage um, people from the places like where I come from in Africa. And so I, I, I sometimes stretch it all the way back to like concepts like Orientalism as like the intellectual habitus through which you know, this idea of putting out false information about other people, you know, kind of takes root. And so for me, I'm interested more about fake news in that context of how it always has functioned as an official policy of managing affairs outside of the West. Uh, interestingly, if you go back in the history of fake news, if you want to go back to the 1600s even, um, where they talk about, you know, the, the theocratic states were talking about propagating the faith, and that's where we get the, de the derived the term propaganda. Going up into the 17th, 18th century, um, you know, it, we still have, you know, fake news took on a uh, different form in terms of hoax stories. Right, literally fake stories designed to either fool people or as entertainment. Then, of course, you have famous cases in the 19th century in the United States, like the Great Moon Hoax. You know, people on the moon and things. That's a, you know hoax stories. Uh, do we still have hoax stories in the 20th century? Yes, we do. Uh, they range from the satirical to the humorous to the extraordinarily deceptive. Like after World War II, you had the the media empire of Henry Luce, who ran like Time and Life magazine. And he was a guy who advocated specifically for the U.S. to create an American century where we would dominate the globe as, to the extent possible. You know, that capitalism and capitalist powers in the United States, corporate power, would, would dominate and sort of establish order throughout the rest of the world. And so he would put out information and a worldview that was in accordance with that. And uh, a lot of important things happen and the American public gets completely misinformed about them. Um, for example, Indonesia in 1965 was described in the New York Times as a gleam of light. And that involved the massacre of 
half a million people to two million people who were Indonesian PKI members. They were communists, but they were involved in the democratic political system there, or the emerging democratic political system. And a lot of just ethnic Chinese were just killed just because they were perceived as being close to the PKI. And there was a, a CIA officer named Ralph McGahey who became one of the famous dissidents of the CIA and reported on a lot of their inner workings. And he used the word fake news in his memoir saying, uh, talking about Indonesia and what really happened there. And he said, today's fake news is tomorrow's fake history. So a lot of the people that are talking about fake news today are connected to institutions that have been creating some of the same fake news that led to the fake history that we have, which is a sort of distorted, idealized version of the U.S. role in the world uh, since the end of World War II especially. It's very difficult to get a peaceful population to go along with basically what we're talking about in war is murder, murder of heads of states, but, but it now certainly murder and uh, destruction of entire cultures and peoples such as the war in Yemen. I think that getting the civilian populations to go along with war for the entire 20th century from the First World War to the Second World War to the First Gulf War where, where Saddam Hussein was charged with ripping babies out of their incubators. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators, and left the children to die on the cold floor. Which was pure propaganda. It never happened. And you need these kinds of shocking um, anti-humanitarian kind of narratives to whip up uh, a civilian population to demonize an enemy. We've seen that now in which Trump constantly demonizes people of color, immigrants. This is a, a dark, fearful place to be and that is where fake news ends up today, oftentimes um, from the legacy of, of war propaganda. Today we're seeing the rise of these pseudo-leftist news organizations that are promoting what we like to call hipster-style propaganda. And those include BuzzFeed and uh, Vice News. And I'm just going to use Vice News as an example of an organization that went from a fashion magazine to um, now one of the top leading media organizations in the world that promotes war propaganda. And how they did this was, first of all, Rupert Murdoch uh, became one of the largest shareholders of the company a few years ago. And Vice News began to slowly but surely align itself and work with um, figures that were coming out of the Obama administration. Um, and so we saw Vice News take a huge shift um, into promoting kind of a neoliberal uh, war agenda. And if you look at some of their coverage, a lot of it echoes what the State Department pushes out in their press releases to promote war um, policies that justify war in countries like Libya, in countries like Syria, and countries like um, Venezuela. And um, a big reason for this is because Vice News has also been found to be receiving a lot of its information about these issues directly from uh, the State Department and directly from the U.S. government through the Broadcast Board of Governors, which is a legal arm of the U.S. government to promote propaganda. The history of media in the United States is not different than almost every other country, and that is that uh, state governments, state actors, try to control the flow of information not only where it goes to, but what's inside that flow. Uh, I would say for inside the United States, a lot of times, you know, historical memory doesn't sometimes go back as far as it should. So a lot of times now when people talk about Trump, they like to compare things to the rise of fascism in Europe and so on in the 1930s. But I think it's just as relevant to look at us being in the moment of 1916 and 1917 and 18, just before the United States went into World War I, where uh, Woodrow Wilson ran on a platform of, he kept us out of the war. And of course, once he got in, he was, you know, was continued on his pro-war footing just more openly. And the people who were against the war suffered severe repression. And that went together with 
the, rep uh, the equivalent of shutting down the Internet that we're seeing now, and that throttling, which at that time was to be able to get things to move from city to city, uh, it was through the mail. If you look back at the early like uh, colonial period and early revolutionary period, America found it really important to have newspapers. And so we subsidized the press in the early start of the country. And that's why every town ended up having about two newspapers. And we um, subsidized the printing press, so media flooded everywhere. You could read news quite often through newspapers. Um, but then in the 20th, 20th century, we started to see changes. People got a little more worried about news because you had seen these things like yellow journalism, which had sold the Spanish-American War to the American public and a lie. And so with these new inventions came out like radio and eventually television. And the public was realizing the dangers of media, that the radio was a really powerful tool. And so there's a big grassroots movement in 1934 for the government to regulate how many media outlets any individual could own. This way we believed diversity of media was good for democracy. Um, we adapted that to newspapers, we adapted that to television. We also put other safeguards in place too. We had a fairness doctrine. So if someone said something negative about you, they had to pay for you to come on their show to get an equal amount of time. And then starting in the 1980s, we started to remove these safeguards. So Bill Clinton with Republican Congress uh, passed the 1996 Telecommunications Act. This law is truly revolutionary legislation that will bring the future to our doorstep. This historic legislation, in my way of thinking, really embodies what we ought to be about as a country. That got rid of the diversity of ownership. So now you could own as many media outlets as you want. We went from 50 corporations down to six. And there's mergers in the books right now. We may go down to four, controlling 90% of our news media. Uh, we got rid of the fairness doctrine. We got rid of proposals to protect kids from advertising in the 70s and 80s. And this allowed this uh, media, news media to pop up that theoretically could say whatever it wanted. And it wasn't doing anything necessarily illegal or immoral. And so you saw Rush Limbaugh came out the same year the fairness doctrine died. Fox News came out the same year of Telecommunications Act. And Americans got a sensibility of news media that, that was... Par, uh, polarized. So it, the facts didn't matter. It was either you took a left-wing perspective or a right-wing perspective. And so we've now ended up in this place where this post-truth reality where people base their assertion on facts, on their political proclivities and actual reality. Um, Fox, for its part, uh, echoes whatever Donald Trump says. In fact, Fox's television show Fox and Friends even caught Donald Trump live tweeting with Fox. So he tells them what to say via Twitter. They repeat it. They comment on it. He then comments on their comments. They then report what he commented. Uh, so this has become the how these outlets are part of the political propaganda apparatuses. Um, and then we have this sort of hyper fake news that's arrived um, where it's it's literally trying to aggregate uh, a community on the basis of their their likes or, or actually their hatred of other people. Um, and that's the most inflammatory, dangerous kind of fake news that's been going on. The assemblage of, of uh, white supremacists or people who are anti-LGBTQ community or other people um, who were assembled because of a very, very strong sensation of, of hatred of the other. So much of the websites that proliferated around fake news, such as the Daily Stormer and Breitbart, they took their cues and they learned very much from the broadcasting of Fox News, which was the first broadcast entity that we had in this country that followed a republic government line. And there are documents and memos that show that um, they took their talking points every day from the Bush White House, that's George W. Bush. The way that it played out in 2016 is often underplayed, I think, in the mainstream media, and where Donald Trump and much of his supporters retweeted and uh, all, so much of the fake news that came from Breitbart and the very uh, dangerous website Daily Stormer that it was openly fascist that they appealed to a very angry base of uh, voters that became voters steeped in racism and anti-immigrant stories. Trump figured out the game. Trump figured out the game is tap into the vulnerabilities. What do the media want? They don't want truth. They were never able to commodify truth. They want eyeballs. They want attention. What gets attention? Spectacles. So Trump was able to get um, the spectacle excitement. He got attention. 
you know, almost um, three to one over Hillary Clinton attention in news media, and he used that to launch his career. The the dominant legacy news media, which is which is dependent on getting large audiences for large advertisers, has done very well by Donald Trump. So uh, rather than just ignore him, uh, they're responding to him immediately and over and over again. And in a way, um, he's, he's been very profitable for them. So they continue to cover him. The trends are negative at the moment with Google changing its algorithms to really uh, dr dr drastically reduce traffic to certain sites like uh, Consortium News, World Socialist website, Truthout. Most of these progressive websites, media outlets, have seen their traffic fall drastically because Google's algorithm just puts, exiles them to some netherworld. And they're basically saying, you over there at Counterpunch, you over there at the National Review, you're outside the mainstream, you're fake news. And so Google is algorithmically suppressing searches so you can't even find those sources anymore unless you know about them already. Facebook is doing it. They're labeling stories fake. Even if they are factually accurate, they just come from sources that are outside you know, that realm of legitimate controversy that's owned by the two major corporate parties and the corporate media. The problem is not just Trump. Uh, the problem is that across the board there is uh, an intensifying crackdown on inconvenient speech of all kinds. There is um, uh, an intensifying crackdown on uh, anti-Zionist speech, right? Uh, uh, which is, you know, cast as anti-Semitism and so classified as a kind of hate speech, and this enables the authorities to police our speech in that way, right? Uh, you know, critics of American foreign policy, uh, those who uh, try to tell the truth about what's going on in places like Syria or Venezuela or Nicaragua or Russia, find themselves, again, uh, uh, blacked out, shadow banned on Facebook, not only were our articles that we were posting on the social media giant not getting the millions of reach that we were getting prior to the 2016 election, but now any article that we posted um, that criticized apartheid in Israel, U.S. aid to dictators around the world, um, or monarchies like Saudi Arabia, or if we criticized um, you know, the war machine, or we exposed the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, or any of those kinds of stories that really brought attention uh, to Americans, what was really going on behind all of the distraction news, those articles were getting flagged by Facebook as inappropriate content. And because it was working hand in hand with um, uh, Saudi funded and NATO funded think tanks like the Atlantic Council, um, what Facebook did is basically give these foreign governments, give the military industrial complex and give the actual war machine, uh, the very powers that be, absolute control over what information Americans see, hear and read. In the last National Defense Authorization Act, there was $160 million of taxpayer money allocated to create what was called a global, uh, global engagement center, which was to create counter-propaganda against fake news. But what's fake news? RT? Uh, yes, according to the U.S. government, that's fake news. Except now they have to register as foreign agents. Are we doing that to the BBC? No. no. Are we, right? So, it's, it's, again, it's propaganda. And so fake news is propaganda. But the whole idea of fake news now being in the news is a way to help them control the narratives and decide which things will be heard as legitimate and which will be completely pushed to the side. The Washington Post, in fact, uh, a national security editor wrote a piece right after the 2016 election about all the conundrum of fake news and said what we need to do is have an organization that's going to tell us what's propaganda and what's not. And it's like, wow, this is going to be fun. Uh, so Craig Timberg wrote this article lionizing a private, shadowy, non-transparent organization called Prop or Not. And Prop or Not is an organization that didn't list who was in it, didn't list what the funding was, didn't list what their criteria or methodology were for determining something as propaganda or not. And they had come up with this list of media organizations that included Mid Press News and other uh, media organizations like Truth, uh, Truth Dig, and I believe Truth Out was on there as well. But then they also clumped us up with a lot of conspiracy sites and right wing sites. Um, that we're promoting a lot of hate. Prop or not is like, we know that there's 200 organizations involved, that they range from being useful idiots for Russia to being stooges for Putin and being Russian agents themselves. 
but on the list were groups like Counterpunch and Negative, I'm sorry, uh, Naked Capitalism and um, uh, Dave Lindorf, an independent journalist out of Philadelphia. This can't be happening. Um, so they're lumping in legitimate independent journalism that challenges the status quo and is, in fact, by the way, challenging the whole Russia Gate narrative. So the, and, and the Washington Post reported this as fact. Simultaneously, in fact, the Washington Post was calling, when Margaret Sullivan was still there as the media editor, she was actually calling then for a retirement of the term of fake news. And yes, we all say, yes, please, we don't want to hear that term anymore. Here we are in a fake news documentary, right? We don't, you know, let's retire the term. How about retire the practice, right? Then we won't have to worry about the term. If we retire the practice of propaganda and fake news, then we don't have to worry about talking about it. But the Washington Post, right at the same time that we have Tim Berg and Proper Knot and Margaret Sullivan saying, I think it's time to retire the term, the Washington Post is running a story about how Russia allegedly uh, hacked the power grid in the state of Vermont. Never happened. When the, when the new system is based on advertising, is based on delivering audiences to advertising, and 80% of that advertising is controlled by two large multinational companies, Google and Facebook, you have a problem. And then the next problem is that they don't see themselves as news producers. They see themselves as basically advertising-driven companies. So they are taking no responsibility for um, controlling the, the curation or the circulation of, that, of that, that information. I think we're at a moment where we really have to challenge what truth is about. Um, we're at a moment where the legacy news model hasn't, is, is failing, and we have to evaluate that. And I think it's a good, good process. It, it wasn't functioning. It was dominated by uh, elite uh, production of news, which didn't serve the majority of people. So that didn't work. Uh, the new one that's based on a, a new group of oligarchs in Silicon Valley uh, making money off of being the distributors of, of news and fake news doesn't work either. Notice we could point fingers in lots of directions. We can blame Hillary, we can blame the DNC, we can blame Republicans, we can blame the corporate media, we can blame Craig Timberg, we can blame Proper Not, we can blame legislators, we can blame blacklisters, we can blame censors, we can blame algorithms. A lot of blame. Guess who else we can blame? Ourselves. Because ultimately, we need to develop critical thinking skills and critical media literacy and political and civic literacy, the degree to which we can ask the right questions and we can understand the complexity of situations where we're in the driver's seat. Fake news, as Trump says it, actually opens up an opportunity for us because he's at least planted the idea in people's head there's something wrong with news media. If you can take that and sort of throw it back at people to say, let's reform news media rather than let's support Trump, um, it opens up a possible avenue. But, um, you know, as Nicholas Johnson reminds us, whatever your first priority is, media be better be your second or no one will ever hear about it. And that is to say, if we don't reform media, it doesn't matter what else you care about. Racism, sexism, classism, violence, war, we're not going to hear about it. We're going to hear a top-down narrative from corporate America about those issues. So you've got to get a media reform system so we can work on the barrage of issues that people care about in the United States. There have been a series of solutions offered to solve the problem of fake news. Censorship, blacklisting, laws and regulations. But all the solutions offered fail to address the root of the problem, one that perpetuates the pernicious influence of fake news. That citizens can't seem to tell fake news from real journalism. Critical media literacy, on the other hand, provides skills essential if the public is to deconstruct propaganda and discern alternative facts from real ones in our supposedly post-truth world. An effective media education would be an education when, where we are tough, when we're given skills to analyze media, but not when we are given a way to think about media. We have to be able to not only recognize information, but decode fake news, false information, and just bias. No matter how much uh, the media or corporations will try to tell you that your opinion does not matter and that you need to listen to the experts, I think an effective media educator empowers their students to stand up against that kind of thinking. Doing your own dive into the facts um, not just taking anyone's word for it, because you can't just take anyone's word for it. That's why it kind of becomes a lifestyle, um, getting into news, um, or just following any kind of social justice issues or issues around the world, because um, you're constantly having to verify everything that's being said and 
forming your own opinion based on your own research. Lately, I've been paying attention to the news that is mainstream, not necessarily believing it, but paying attention to what the person is trying to tell me and also listening to what they're not telling me. Like, for example, I was not aware that fake news can come from any source. Like, the New York Times has posted numerous articles that were entirely falsified. Washington Post has done the same things, and those are two of my main sources for news. So, uh, but that's taught me to not just, you know, read, but to question what I read, to question everything. And that's what, that's what everyone should do. We're in a time where we know that the media are biased and that we should be the one responsible to make sure that we are aware of it. I think being able to be a part of a team that helps open other people's eyes, get a clearer perspective of things and um, get people's voices out there, I think that's, that's highly important to me. I mean, I come from obviously a community that's not always had a voice. And as I'm reading and consuming media, I try to look for the voices that are not there and understand that there's an agenda behind every single piece of media that I consume. Um, I know that journalists, you know, are taught to strive for objectivity, but what is that striving process, right? I don't necessarily know if there's a problem with bias as long as we're clear, right? I mean, we are human beings researching stories. We are human beings writing stories. That brings a certain level of subjectivity. Journalism's job isn't to be objective and impartial. It's to tell the people what is, what's really going on. And as an educator, I think my job is to give people the tools how to think, not to tell them what to think by what's on the test. You know, if I want to search for good education about media, I really have to put in the time to be able to do it and then find that valuable source that I can maybe go, keep going back to. You got to turn off that television, you, you got to turn off that social media, and you have to start looking for what's real. So real news is storied information that has six ingredients. Number one, it's recent. Uh, sorry, real news. Real news is recent, number one. Number two, real news is relevant, which is to say it's in play in the culture. It's something that people are talking about. Uh, real news is number three, reliable, which is to say it's uh, transparently sourced. Real news number four um, is about uh, historical context. It provides some sense of history in the story. Number five, real news is, as we like to say in the business, hegemonic, which is to say it's about power relations. It foregrounds power relations. And finally, real news number six is harmonious in the sense that it offers multiple points of view, not sort of a blue state, red state, black versus white, he said, she said, but more nuanced and more sort of multi-perspectival, as we say in the business. So that, I think, is a good definition of real news. And when you define real news that way, you realize it can kind of be hard to find. I think that folks need to get a bit more comfortable with researching on their own. Not that everyone needs to be a journalist, but everyone needs to do a little bit more work in becoming media literate, because at this point in time, with the internet, everyone can be a journalist. There can be a lot of, of uh, sort of false narratives, right? Uh, and so independent news, I think, gets kind of pushed into that corner because they're less familiar, right? I mean, even if you don't like the New York Times, it's familiar, right? Even if you don't like the mainstream, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, we know who they are, right? With independent news, I think we have less, of, less knowledge of who they are. So it is on us as audiences to learn more about them. We have to talk about the contexts in which fake news is produced and circulated, right? So we have to talk about what are the social contexts that, uh, and the technological uh, uh, media that make the circulation of fake news possible. And we have to educate ourselves about um, how fake news is constituted and how it spreads. It is to look not just at the content, not just at representation, but also again that behind the scenes, the forces of production, who owns, who distributes, right? Who owns, who produces, and who distributes? Because that's where a lot of, that's where the power is, right? Teaching people the political economy of the media, you know, about the relationships with advertisers and with the government and so on, the history of the First Amendment and the function of copyright, all this information uh, needs to be made available 
to everybody in this country, everybody, which means it should be a standard part of the curriculum in all, all our grade and high schools. Uh, most of the rest of the world in Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia, North Africa, they all saw that this media could potentially be a problem and of dangers about 30 or 40 years ago. Um, at that time, they all tried to change their schooling policies to make sure that students went into this media-saturated society with some semblance of ways of protecting themselves, right? So some way to know how to sift through media and protect yourself. The U.S. is unique. We did not. We dropped this massive cultural bomb upon a generation without the skills to sift through it. And so uh, we now end up in a society where the majority of people, they don't know the difference between who funds media, how that impacts the media. They don't understand like, that their data is being collected. They don't understand they're being spied on. They don't understand they're being surveilled. They don't understand their search history is being collected and then exchanged for advertising companies and other things. So you would think the solution would be to, to train people with a critical media literacy so they're more aware of how to use these tools properly and in a way that is very responsible in the sense that they're not going to get manipulated to the point where they're radicalized or something like that. However, the techno-utopian view is not that. The techno-utopian view is we just need more technology. Similarly, YouTube wanted to add Wikipedia pages to its content. However, this is severely problematic in, in its own right. Wikipedia is created through crowdsourcing, and people vote on content by either changing or not changing content. So if everybody is, is poisoned with falsehoods, how can we expect them to democratically decide what is true and what is not true? So this techno-utopian view, though, has largely taken over because America has a worshipping of these, these figures like Mark Zuckerberg, who claims that he's delivering democracy to the world, although there's no evidence the guy's ever taken a course on democracy. One of the most uh, hopeful things, if I can use that phrase, is that uh, people all over the world now are taking media into their own hands and making images and pictures and representing themselves. Um, so I think for the future, what we need to figure out is to how to circulate that information more. I think for me, the best way to learn about how to, ch how to make change is how people from the bottom up are making change. I would be sort of proud to say that I think Project Censored is part of that effort. Um, for 40 some years since the foundation of the project in 1976, Project Censored has been engaging um, students and uh, uh, college and university professors in an ongoing effort to identify news stories that are important but underreported. So there are important news stories that are, are reported in the independent press, they're high quality news stories, but they're not getting the attention they deserve in the corporate media. People don't trust corporate media and I think that's good, but I think people are also wary of trusting any sort of media and that's of course really dangerous. So I think that people need to not only look at the media as something that's over there, that oh those people don't know what you're talk what they're talking about. Media always needs sources and media always needs help. So we need to really blow up what the news is about and start talking about what kinds of information and truth and knowledge do we need to survive going forward and how can we not only uh, learn about that and deconstruct it, take it apart and figure out where we can get the best information, but how can we learn to make it ourselves? Trying to get the students to be creative and talk about creating their own stories, their own images that are an alternative vision for the future. Right now, in terms of the environment, the vision of the future is pretty bleak. It doesn't have to play out that way. We can, we've already laid the groundwork for understanding, for example, the ways in which global warming was denied through a concerted public relations effort. Once we know that, we have to move on to creating our own narratives. So I'm really inspired by just like the tenacity and the willingness for change and the willingness to have these uncomfortable conversations with the younger generation. And so I'm inspired by that. It's up to us to create the media that we want to consume. You know, like be the change you want to see. Well, you know, like kind of create the media you want to see. Like why not? We all have the tools, we all have the brains. You know, we all have the information. They find youthful constituencies are not afraid to criticize capitalism. They are well aware that the American political system is broken, that the corporations, public relations, and all of the ways in which money determines and that the wealth and powerful can basically call the shots in America, they understand that this needs to change. 
millennials in particular give me a lot of hope, the folks born between 1980 and, and 2000. Uh, they've grown up with these tools and they're already in the streets. We see them in all these different movements from Occupy to Black Lives Matter and Democracy Spring and Me Too and Dreamers and DACA. They've seen the failures of neoliberalism. They've seen the failures of this uh, technocratic belief that we must worship uh, technology. And what's key is that not only they recognize these things, but they're going into direct confrontation. Nothing's done in the history of the United States without direct confrontation. Um, Whites did not start uh, coming around to granting civil rights until we had bus protests and violence in the streets. Um, you didn't have women have the right to vote until there was conflicts during World War I in the street. I'm highly optimistic this generation is going to make the change that we needed. Yeah, it's going to be painful, it's going to be difficult, but I'm optimistic. And I think if you're a true educator, you really are in the streets with your students, not just studying them on campus or talking about them in the classroom. This is only really going to work and make a bigger splash when everybody is part of that solution. And even better, part of rethinking and recreating the kind of world that we really want to have and what kind of information system will be necessary to do that in a world where we are ever, ever tilting against fake news. My name is Chase Palmieri. I'm the co-host of the Project Censored radio show and podcast with Mickey Huff, but I'm also the CEO and co-founder of a news review site called Credder.com. Now, Credder.com is just one of the many solutions being offered to solve kind of our fake news crises that we've talked about today. But what's interesting about Credder is that you can actually start to review the news that you're reading. So the way Credder works is it kind of takes a Rotten Tomatoes style approach to the news where we have a critic category of verified journalists and a public category where you can actually review the articles that you're already reading. Now these reviews will aggregate up into scores for the articles, authors, and outlets. And what this really is, is it's the first ever example of creating reputation that informs the readers, reputation scores for those authors and outlets. And again, this is how we can hold media accountable as news consumers. Many industries with consumers are going to have a way for the consumers to hold those producers accountable. And Credder is offering one of the many solutions in that space. If you really want to be active on the go as a news consumer, you can now use Credder.com, C-R-E-D-D-E-R.com, as one of the ways to review news content and hold media accountable and start to actually feel empowered as a news consumer in the digital age. Thank you.